Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. Deborah Eisenberg's much-anticipated new collection of short stories, Your Duck is My Duck, compels us to confront the most disturbing truths about ourselves, from our intimate lives as lovers, parents, and children, to our equally troubling roles as citizens on a violent, terrifying planet. Each of the six stories has the heft and complexity of a novel. In her world, the forces of money, sex, and power cannot be escaped. She's a MacArthur Foundation Fellow and the a recipient of numerous honors, including the 2011 Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the Whiting Writers Award. She's published a, a bunch of short story collections, including Transactions in a Foreign Currency under the 82nd Airborne all around Atlantis and Twilight of the Superheroes. Her fifth, Your Duck is My Duck, is published by Echo, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. I'm very pleased it has brought Deborah Eisenberg to our show. Hello. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I, I left out the fact that there have been two, also two books that have collected previous short stories. True. Uh, this is your first collection in a dozen years. How long does it take you to write a story? demonstrably a very long time <laughs> it, it i really uh it very rarely takes me less than about a year but i'm not writing steadily i teach one semester and i don't write during that semester mm -hmm. and then you say you write about two hours a day well it it depends entirely on what stage i'm at and what i'm working on when I begin something in the early stages, two hours is about all I can do, and then I have to sleep. But if <laughs> I'm finishing something, I can really work around the clock. And you know when you're finished? Oh, yes. I, I don't find it a mystery at all. Are you ever surprised by what you've written when you read the completed story and uh, and wonder, like some of your characters, how you got here? I'm always astonished. I I really have never had the experience of knowing where I'm going. I don't I don't use outlines. I don't have what is generally called an idea. <laughs> I in other words, you, when you start you're not saying, "Oh, I want to write a story about such and such." Not at all. Um uh, usually there's some sort of urgent feeling, but it's masked. So I don't exactly know what it is, and I just have to follow along. Some writing teachers tell the students that they need to know everything about their characters, their relationships to money, how they feel on a crowded subway, even if those details don't make it into the story. Um, but you say that you even though your characters are really well-defined, that you don't really know them. No, I really don't. Or I don't know them any better than I know other people, <laughs> which is to say there are certainly things about them I don't know and don't care about. I don't care what they have for breakfast. <laughs> I don't care what they're sleep habits are i don't although in one story we do know about yes sleep habits. <laughs> well that's absolutely <laughs> integral to the story um but yes there are a lot of things i don't know often including their futures mm -hmm. so at the end of the story you're not one of those people who says okay now what happens to not this at person all. not at all you said that you never would have become a writer if you hadn't gotten encouragement from your longtime partner, Wallace Shawn. Does he still make suggestions about your work, and, and do you ever make suggestions about his writing? Every once in a blue moon, I've made an unwelcome <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> but I don't really. We, 
we don't show each other mm-hmm. what we're working on until we're finished. He really is finished when he's finished. I am not necessarily finished when I'm finished. And he is a spectacularly good reader. And if there's something that he doesn't understand or finds awkward, I definitely pay attention. Uh, You appreciate that, obviously. Very, very much. Because we all need editors on some level. I don't know whether your editors at your publishers also make suggestions. Do you know, I haven't had that experience much, but with this, this book, my editor and publisher, Dan Halperin, was extremely helpful with the story that was the one I finished last. And I was very baffled by that story. It was completely unlike anything I had ever done. And I couldn't find my way in it for a long time. And he saw the last uh, several drafts, and he was extremely helpful. Almost every short story writer I've spoken to has told me that uh, an agent uh, and editors uh, at their publishers have encouraged them to write a novel, but you never have. Uh, on the other hand, you have written a play and a book about the painter Je- Jennifer Bartlett. So um, ha- how have you been able to resist? There hasn't been any difficulty. <laughs> I I just... I'm not interested, really, in filling up the pages. I know any writing of mine would be much more saleable if it were longer, but I really like to boil things down to the extent that I'm able to. Although your your stories aren't short in the usual sense of short stories. They run around 40 pages or so, and they have the feel of a novel or a novella because you allow yourself to digress yes. in a way that classic short stories are not supposed to. That's true. So just think how long they'd be if they were novels. <laughs> but it's And it's, how long they'd take you to write. And how long they'd take. Actually, probably not that much longer. I'd just leave in all the stuff I've, I cut. <laughs> in uh, his rave review in... Uh, the uh, Sunday New York Times, Paul, what was his name? Uh, Paul Segal wrote that often your sentences are wild, full of breakneck swerves, leaps in time, space, and point of view, all kinds of syntactic fireworks. I'm glad. (laughs) (laughs) He's glad that he saw that. Although uh, I uh, am struck by how each story has a different voice. I'm glad most you writers feel that. most writers develop a voice and and uh, you know once in a while they diverge but uh, they're pretty much a John Updike story sounds like a John Updike story. I'm very very glad you say that. I that of course is an interest of mine is is uh, to be rather transparent and allow the characters to tell the story. And also, I like to explore different, you might say, tonal values. I enjoy that a lot. I mentioned that uh, teachers often tell their students uh, certain things about how to write a story. What do you tell your students at Columbia? Don't listen to what (laughs) people tell you. Uh Uh, Really, every writer, I think, is different. And... The objective, in my view, is to access areas and elements of your mind that cannot be discovered in any other way. So that's the task, and go about it in whatever way you need to go about it, and then something interesting and idiosyncratic will show up on the piece of paper. And obviously it's been appreciated because except for, I I gather you had trouble getting your first story published, you've been 
published widely ever since. And uh, I, assuming that if I were a magazine editor and you said, I have a story for you, <laughs> I'd be very excited. I am not so sure. It has, I've frequently been invited to submit a story to one place or another. And the usual response is, what is known as an encouraging rejection, but usually it comes in the form of, oh, thank you, send us any other story, <laughs> just not this one. A story that you've been working on, you say, for around a year. Yeah. So that's why uh, the there, there haven't been, although there have been five collections, I've said, and then two other kinds of collections, collections of collections, uh, you're, you really are... It takes you at least six years to put together a collection like this? Apparently so. I mean, the next one, if there is a next one, it might be different. I might sit down after the show and write it. But, no, I am a very, very slow writer. I read very slowly. I think slowly. I do everything slowly. I walk slowly. <laughs> I'm speaking with Deborah Eisenberg, whose latest collection of short stories is Your Duck is My Duck. And uh, doesn't that title come from a Zen riddle of, about a Zen master and a duck that are trapped in a bottle? Well, either it does or it doesn't. That is, somebody told me that he, somebody had told him this purported Zen riddle, uh, which ends, it's not my duck, it's not my bottle, it's not my problem. <laughs> and I had that filed away for about a decade. And I did look it up online, and it seemed to be there as a Zen riddle, although it's so improbable, it just seems impossible that it would be. But then I looked it up again, and it had disappeared. And in your story, it's told by uh, the host at a dinner party who's uh, been a bit inebriated. Did you know when you put that in that that had to be the title of the story? Oh, yes, <laughs> the title. In that case, sometimes titles take a long time for me to find. But in that case, I knew that was the title. Why did you choose to not give the narrator of that story uh, a name? Very good question. And I have no idea what the answer is. But but was she f she real in your mind while you were writing, or whether you had a name for her or not? Oh, as real as any other character is to me, yes. She meets Ray and Krista at a party, and they immediately invite her to visit them at their home in a uh, a, uh, on a, that's a tropical estate. Uh, they um, have bought one of her best paintings from her ex-husband, and they're collecting artists as well? Uh, yes, they're collectors as well as business people. They're plutocrats, mm -hmm. tycoons. And they've also collect, invited a, a satirical puppeteer composer named... Uh, Amos uh, Voinovich, uh, who's working on a show called The Hand That Feeds You. Why would they want to collect him? Oh, I imagine that he had a rather fashionable cult <laughs> following. You could have called the story The Hand That Feeds You as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what is his play about? His puppet It's a show. musical play, right? Yes, it is. Um, and the narrator has previously seen one of his musical puppet shows, which is, which seems to have been about Scott and Amundsen reaching the South Pole. But this one is about uh, a wicked king and queen who enslave people working in the mines to bring them gold and jewels. And the slaves are serfs and donkeys mm -hmm. and um, there is an uprising a slave uprising of these uh, serfs and donkeys 
and bats function as <laughs> couriers. Um, but then the slave uprising is quelled and all of the slaves are murdered except for the strongest and so are the king and queen and the operation is taken over by some big corporations uh, so there's there's a metaphor here because uh, in a sense we're all puppets of the uh of ruthless corporate executives i would say that is the <laughs> metaphor yes <laughs> But, but you you deny that you are uh, explicitly political in your writing, but there's always politics there. It's impossible to avoid them or evade them. I write, as I'm sure almost all writers do, about what composes my mind there there it, one doesn't have any other resource that's it uh if one is writing fiction and not g genre fiction and i i find it hard to believe that there are many people in our country or on the planet at this moment whose heads are not stuffed with political problems but you also say you resist being explicit about the politics. At the same time, uh, you've set this story during a real estate collapse, uh, and uh, we, the reader gets the sense that we should fear ruthless corporate executives. That's a statement so true and universal <laughs> that it can hardly be considered <laughs> explicitly political. <laughs> So it, was the 2008 recession one of the inspirations for that story? You know, I really don't remember what started it. I have, it's almost a condition, I suppose, but it seems to be shared by a lot of fiction writers, or my, my evidence of this is utterly anecdotal. But as soon as one finishes a story, one has no memory of writing it or how it got to be that way. Really? Truly. Uh, uh, in this in this case, Ray is, uh, we mentioned he and Krista are the ones who invited your narrator to their uh, estate. How does, he, how does he earn his money? How does Ray earn yes. his money? Well, he uh, buys a lot of land and he buys a lot of things he seems to he seems to be very very involved in a lot of business ventures he buys eucalyptus trees yes and, in this and case, we have uh, I, I just recently did a show about how flammable eucalyptus trees no are. really yes. uh, oh that's absolutely we were talking amazing. about the the, the, uh, the all of the uh, the fires in California and in Portugal. In Portugal, they have uh, Salazar encouraged people to replace uh, trees. They want to do a lot of lumber, lumbering with eucalyptus trees, and they just wind up with fires all the time. That's absolutely amazing. I had no idea. But I did choose eucalyptus very, very purposefully because it, would, it figures, at least in this story, in a cycle of environmental degradation and because um, there have been repeated floods and then droughts a lot of the agriculture has washed away or died in uh, this particular area where people earn their earn their livelihoods by small farms through their small farms and eucalyptus um, roots very, very, very quickly. And so Ray, the businessman, has planted all this eucalyptus so that the earth will hold. But then, of course, it does burst into flames and lightning storms. And although the story addresses some of the most pressing issues of our time, like extreme economic disparity and environmental degradation, it also includes some very funny details. Uh, 
do you just write funny? Uh, do, uh, do you think it's important <laughs> to include humor when you're writing about <laughs> pressing issues? Well, I don't really put it in with a syringe. I mean, either it's there or it just pops it isn't. into your head. Or... Absolutely, I'm. I don't really make a big distinction between funny and serious or funny and sad. It does depend on the distance from which you're looking at something at a given moment. But the things that are very, very, very serious are also, from a certain distance, quite funny. The, the narrator is at a dinner with accountants who are helping Ray acquire a company, and they tell a joke that mentions credit swap rates, which uh, she recognizes as English language, but so highly specialized as to be difficult for anyone not to know, uh, not in the know to understand. There are a lot of highly specialized forms of English in the modern economy. Does language provide cover for inappropriate business dealings? Clearly. I mean, I mean, clearly that so much of uh, what we understand of uh, business that's going on around us is it's legal, but it's completely unethical. And yet it's, uh, how do you put this, language washed? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, there's a very sort of clinical language that's used to sanitize it. And it's only after the everything hits the fan uh, that, uh, for example, in 2009, when we started hearing about all of these things that had looked perfectly benign until then, and then realized that uh, they were creating this terrible mess. Oh, yes. I mean, our biggest institutions, and theoretically the ones that we trust and our lives depend on, for example, banks, it's just unbelievable what banks have been allowed to do. In one of your best-known stories, Twilight of the Superheroes, which uh, was in an earlier collection and said it's uh, on September 11th, you wrote, the wars in the East were hidden behind a thicket of language, patriotism, democracy, loyalty, freedom. The words bounced around, changing purpose as if they were made out of some funny plastic. So um, you've been thinking about how language can be used and misused for quite a while now. There's a lot about language in these stories. It's true that there is a lot about language very, very explicitly in these stories. And naturally, I grew up in the middle of the century, the, the 20th, that is, the previous one. And uh, first of all, I think 1984 was one of... It, I read it, I remember, when I was 13. And it was not... It was not uh, mystifying in any way because we were very conscious. I would say a lot of my generation was very conscious of the linguistic manipulation of advertising. So, yes, it's a fundamental concern. We're seeing that now in all of these political ads. Absolutely. Uh, some of them are kind of shockingly misleading, but... Uh, I wonder, are, why aren't we more suspicious? Why do we buy into them? You know, that is such a fascinating issue, I think, and really... Because we want to believe? We want to believe, I don't know. I think, you know, we're so bought off, really, by our relative comforts, and also, now that those comforts are diminishing, 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 we're still bought off by the fantasy that somehow we will be comfortable, very comfortable. You wrote in that story, Twilight of the Superheroes, about that, uh, that language. What did they actually refer to? It seemed they all might refer to money. Yes. Yes, I think that's <laughs> true. I think that's true. Certainly when people speak of freedom and democracy now, Usually, they're talking about money. Mm -hmm. 
very painful. Oh, can I take back something that I said? Of course you can. Thank you so much. I believe that I said that things that are very, very serious are also very funny, depending on your distance away from them. Well, some very, very serious things, you would have to be on in another galaxy before right. they were funny. Slavery's not funny. It, it, there, there is nothing funny about it uh -huh. from, from any distance <laughs> that I can imagine. So it, w do you know uh, what leads you to see an amusing thing in something? Uh, obviously, uh, you're, you're not going to cross the line when you're writing about something like slavery, but uh, is, does a, a light bulb suddenly go off in your head? I don't know. Or you know. just find yourself writing a sentence and say, oh, gee, that, uh, that's interesting. Well, yes, yeah, sometimes things, I mean, for example, in the instance I think that you were referring to, the businessman Ray mm -hmm. and his accountants telling these awful jokes, um, it's the behavior that's funny. Well, Ray also cheats on his wife, but she takes him back he, over and over again. Well, it could be a two-way street. I'm not sure. <laughs> you didn't ask them specifically. I didn't for ask details. them specifically, but <laughs> I think at the beginning of the story, it suggested that each mm -hmm. goes on his or her own way from time to time. I'm speaking with Deborah Eisenberg, whose latest collection of short stories is Your Duck is My Duck. This is Leonard Lopit at Large. The The story Merge, uh, one of the other stories in this collection, is also about language, and it's about privilege. What was the inspiration for that? Got me. Mm. Sorry. You... Uh, quote in it, you quote both Noam Chomsky and Donald Trump, who once said, I know words, I have the best words. Yes, yes, and um, uh, it's just such an outlandish statement that it was irresistible <laughs> to, uh, to use in the epigraph there. Um, Are you surprised by some of the the statements he makes, I'm, every so often he says things that totally befuddle me, and uh, I, I wonder who understands what he really is trying to say and uh, whether, whether they truly respond positively to those things. I, I'm not sure I understand what I know words, I have the best words oh, means. Who, who, who can imagine? No, I think He's winding a skein, uh, a sort of verbal skein of confusion. Um, uh, my sweetheart pointed out that he is something like a stand-up, that he uses some of the techniques as to what he means or what people are responding to. I don't think it's the words. I think that it is... Uh, clues to attitudes. Does Wally feel like he has uh, some kind of insight into Trump because he's also an actor as well as, as well, and a playwright? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether he does. Uh, but I, I was surprised by his observation mm -hmm. that this was very much like stand-up, and mm -hmm. I thought, oh, yes, that's right. In the story Merge, uh, Keith is, is kicked out of the house by his father, the CEO of Synth Aqua Solutions, uh, a company that buys up water rights all over the world. Yes, Synthaquat. <laughs> Synthaquat, ah. Uh, Keith leaves his cell phone behind and is unable to function without it. And you write... Without his electronics, he was a virtual amputee in that the fine mesh of, of chats, emails, postings, and so on that had buoyed him uh, along shriveled away overnight. He strained to receive the world's breeding influx, which had sustained him as the plankton sustains a whale, but it was nowhere. Uh, would Keith have met Celeste, his love interest, if he had had his cell phone? 
Oh, of course not. Yes, that hadn't really struck me before, but it's an actual human-on-human meeting, Mm -hmm. which would have been totally out of his sphere. There was a report in the New York Times recently that some Silicon Valley entrepreneurs will not allow their kids to have cell phones or screens anymore because they know how bad they are for people and brain development. Yes, that's not at all surprising. I'm not at all surprised that they are the first to sound the alarm, even though I'm sure that they hadn't intended to sound it. But yes, I think. Are you a sounding alarm? This the alarm with the story? Uh, not really. Although I did have a certain amount of fun with electronics, <laughs> I am very. I mean, in the story, and I am very ill at ease with with much of the electronic world. I'm grateful to have a computer. I'm very grateful for things I can do with it, but it does scare me. And I don't use a lot of other electronics. People often use their cell phones as a way of not having to deal with other things. In the old days, uh, people in elevators would look at their shoes. (laughs) (laughs) Now they look at their cell phones. (laughs) Right. And I'm always amazed when I'm on the subway by how many people I see listening to something on their cell phones. I guess it's a way that it protects us against having to deal with the 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 crush of the crowds. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And the stories in in this book take place in, in present day. Many of them in New York. The subways are a mess, and you write that the news quote like a magical substance in a fairy tale was producing perpetually increasing awfulness from rock bottom bad. Yeah, I wrote that a couple of years ago, three or four years ago. (laughs) And it's gotten worse. Oh, perpetually increasing awfulness. Well, the MTA wasn't as hated then as it is today. Yeah, I continue to love it, but but it it really is having a lot of problems. Uh, Well, I mentioned language is a recurring theme throughout these stories. Are you thinking about it differently now than you used to? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's just that we're so bombarded with manipulative um, and misused language. And I was thinking the other day, I actually made a call to order something from an online source. And the person I was talking to on the other side of it was very nice and so scripted Mm -hmm. that... if some something unexpected had occurred, I don't know what she would have done, which was, I guess, the usual experience. And I find it increasingly, increasingly demoralizing because you have no idea what the experience of the other person is. But it, it can be very frustrating. You call some company and for 10 minutes, you just wind up uh, being directed by a, a non-person uh, to finally speak to a person and then when you finally get through after waiting for a while and hearing the same messages again and again and again they are scripted as like speaking to a robot uh, oh entirely and it's what happened to spontaneity what indeed <laughs> and I think it's mostly demoralizing because it's intended to manipulate it's so manipulative which makes one feel shame, I feel. How do you decide when you're writing a story? Is this something you decide right away, uh, whether to tell it in the first or third person? No, usually that comes pretty naturally and pretty automatic, automatically. But sometimes I have to play around switching back and forth to see what what leverages out what. And many writers have told me that until they got that first sentence, they really could not proceed. Uh, is the first sentence the first sentence you write, or is it something that comes in retrospect as you are in the middle of it and realize you have to go back and start at a certain place? I almost invariably write sequentially. Mm. In one of the stories, Taj Mahal, you mix excerpts from a memoir with the critical responses of the people who are written about in it. 
uh, a group of older actors who get together to talk about the book. Does that story address what many people accuse writers of doing, using their stories for their own purposes? Uh, what would my purpose be with this one? Well, I'm just wondering oh. what uh, you no know, writers in general. People often uh, a number have told me uh, that when their parents or uh, friends realize that uh, a certain thing in a story really was based on something that had oh. happened in their lives, oh, they I they got see. upset. Well, I don't write about real people, mm -hmm. so. Of course, people often imagine that they're, they've been written about, but I don't use real people. And the opposite, I'm told, happens a lot, that from fiction writers I know who do write about real people, the real people never recognize uh, themselves. One writer recently told me that her mother got very upset when uh, the mother in the story uh, advised her daughter to go into therapy uh, or... or, or complain when the daughter went into therapy that it was kind of like a, a, a jacuzzi situation. Oh, funny. Yeah. Uh, is uh, Taj Mahal a story for other writers? Obviously, writers draw upon, as I said there, uh, draw upon uh, the stories and experiences of friends and, and family members. How do you decide what you can use? For me, it's it's pretty simple. I just don't use... So you don't have to ask for permission. I don't. It, I There's one story in that collection that is as close to autobiographical as anything I've ever written. That is, it does have material in it that resembles um, uh, parts of my family in a highly fictionalized and distorted form. And I did clear it uh with uh, certain family members who um, I felt m might have uh, m might have felt self conscious, and uh, although they're not in the story, and nobody living is in that story, mm -hmm. uh, other than me, if you count me, I'm guessing what story that is, and in that story, language can be used in a very cruel way. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. One of the characters in Taj Mahal, Emma, feels as if, and I'm quoting, someone's grimy hands have plunged deep into her foundation's rearranging elements. Are writers aware of the effect their books can have uh, on, on uh, people? In this case, we're talking about a memoirist. Uh, you, you haven't written memoir, but uh, I'm sure you've spoken to a number of people about it, and often... Uh, there's there's a lot of talk about how memoir and fiction often uh, there's a very blurred line. Yes, and that is why I don't write. Uh, I don't use real people because I it's incredibly powerful mm -hmm. writing, and everything is a mis uh, misrepresentation, even if it's a very valuable one. Uh, laudable, flattering, uh, gratifying. It's not reality. Well, although that story is about a memoir, uh, can't the same thing be said about the Internet? Sometimes somebody posts a story online and it takes on a life of its own with many people believing it to be fact. Well, that seems to be happening mm -hmm. all around us at a fantastic clip. The, the story has lots of funny moments, such as when uh, they were shooting a movie scene with an actor, an actress, and a dog, and everybody's on edge, and you write, even if they could budget in an extra day to shoot the scene again, the dog has another commitment. <laughs> Was I that think, based on anything that, that you heard? No, <laughs> uh, no, but I think it must work that way, that these remarkably well-trained animals are in great demand, I think, for, for film and TV. The, uh, the, the memoirist is uh, Clement Rouse, and his grandfather, Anton, is, uh, was a famous director who escaped Nazi Germany. One of the other characters speaking about him remarks, people always say, oh, things might not be great here, but it's stable. Our problems are ordinary. 
And then the next thing you know, laws are gutted, the economy comes crashing down, people are in the streets. It's all the fault of the ones with beards or without beards or whoever. Yeah. And um, that sounds very much like what's happening right now in in the lead up to this election. Absolutely. Again, I wrote this um, uh, maybe five years ago, but we're right in the middle of a culture of frantic scapegoating and uh, terrible, terrible the the utilization of prejudices and uh, well, every day who look around uh, children are being shot, black people are being shot Today, some two women were shot because they were women. Um, Jews are being shot. It it really is just absolutely terrifying, absolutely terrifying, and it's all a result of uh, the unleashing and legitimizing of virulent and inaccurate prejudices. It, uh, they never seem to go away. I was wondering why. For example, we're seeing a resurgence of Nazism in Austria, uh, in France. Uh, Marine Le Pen's uh, party is gaining in popularity in Italy. Uh, The neo-fascists are part of the government. Uh, In Hungary, there is uh, something that looks very close to uh, a neo-Nazi thing. Do these people not remember what all of that the destructiveness of that in the in the the thirties and forties. Apparently, memory is not the problem. Well, <laughs> but they but they must study history. Well, yes. I mean, they. Of course, everybody has the information. It's um, a matter of what one wants to do with the information. It's very terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. I don't know, Lenny, you may feel this way, but uh, also I feel that we were born at, well, I was born at the exact end of what seemed to be the exact end of fascism in Europe. And um, certainly through my youth, I thought, well, that's over. But as you say... It never goes away. It never goes away. And also, people, uh, there are people in this country who see Hitler and Mussolini as heroes. Yes. Your story, The the Third Tower, continues uh, with the theme of language. And and this one's uh, a, a... This one is a dystopia where language is wielded as a, a conformity tool. Yes, as I believe it partially is now, that's certainly one of its uh, social or political functions. Um, That, incidentally, was the last completed, and that was the one that Dan Halpern was so uh, Mm -hmm. generously helpful with, um, because it is very different, really, from my other stories. And it took me quite some time to get a solid footing in it. I, I really had to um, make a number of radically different drafts. And and why is that? Uh, uh, because you're just not exactly sure what you want to say in the story? Well, that's always the problem. <laughs> but uh, usually I have, I have uh, guideposts that are more securely placed, uh, as you say, a more naturalistic world. I mean, I always sort of slide, I think particularly in these stories, I slide a little bit away from naturalism and merge slides a little farther and the third tower slides very far. But um, the closer you are, and usually my stories are set in the present, although these 
most of these are not set in exactly the present. They're set in some yeah. parallel time. And sometimes you like to have an, an ambiguous setting as well. Yes. The yeah. the writer in the uh, the review in the New York Times wrote that the ambiguous gift of Eisenberg's characters is that they never become fully acclimated to our planet, to its beauty or horror, or mundanity for that matter. Even the smallest activity remains monstrously difficult. Uh, and quote you, I began to unpack, but there was the issue of putting things wherever. <laughs> that sounds like what you've been saying <laughs> about how your approach to writing as well. Yes. Uh, it seemed to be a curse that everything was incomprehensible to me, and I couldn't manage to do anything, but maybe it's some sort of blessing. Now, uh, in the face of it, this collection of stories is may be regarded as your least political book, and yet politics is everywhere. Is Every it impo it's impossible to escape it? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I suppose my first book was almost devoid of identifiable politics. Um, but then you wrote stories about Central America. Yes, and yes. I was thinking about them uh, with this invasion that we are now being warned about. Oh, isn't this just the most tragic and and horrifying thing that these poor people struggling their way up from situations of our creation are being vilified and criminalized. And then one thinks of the children in these concentration camps at the border. It's just uh, one can hardly believe the wickedness of all this. How did you become interested in the situation in Central America? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, my wonderful sweetheart, Wally Sean, who you've mentioned, uh, became very interested in, in socialist economies and seeing what was going on. And he wanted to have a look at Nicaragua since the news we were getting up here was obviously inaccurate and... Uh, very, very incomplete, and um, this is at the time of the uh, the Sandinistas, and exactly, it was after the Sandinista rev revolution. Mm -hmm. But while we were funding the Contras to take down that government, um, which has now, alas, turned in on itself and taken itself down in a way, um, but. Uh, I, I was very ignorant about the the situations in various Central American countries, particular, particularly Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Uh, but when I began to read about them and read and understand what my hard-earned tax dollars were going to support, I became very interested. It occurred to me uh, once that uh, when I read works of fiction that take place in a certain time, I actually learn all sorts of things that I could never have learned from reading a history of that time. Yes. Yes. I mean, I my objective for my own writing is not to be educational. I'm not really interested in that. Um, nor is my objective as a reader. I'm an aesthete, and I love to read beautiful or fascinating, compelling things. And write really interesting sentences. And write really interesting sentences. But like you, I have found that I'd say the greater part of my education has come through reading fiction reading Dickens as a child, um, I really learned a lot about the paradigms that are informing our life today, to say nothing about learning about Dickens's England. And the same applies to the great Russian writers, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, 
check off. Absolutely. Uh, not only learn about the human condition, you also learn about uh, all sorts of complicated political things, even when politics aren't explicitly discussed. Speaking of which, and speaking of your series of underread books, uh, Turgenev's Spring Torrents mm. is, I think, the best thing I've ever read about slavery, even though the word is mentioned once. We did uh, talk about his book, Virgin <laughs> Soil, which yes. uh, is about the revolutionaries who are um, actually leading to the assassination of the czar and reading it, uh, it you, you're very much reminded of 1968 in this yes. country and, and even some more recent things. Yes, yeah. So I guess the human condition is always the human condition. It's all too human, <laughs> all too human. Uh, I'm assuming <laughs> you're me. in the process of working on some more stories. You, you did write a play. I did write a play. Are you play. tempted to do that again? Uh, it doesn't depend on me. So, Oh, you mean write a, another play? Mm. Not really. I love writing fiction, and I'm not in the process of anything. Mm. But, yes, I mean, uh, plays are absolutely wonderful for those who are good at them. Mm. It's not my forte. Uh, although you write good dialogue. Yes. I Well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I enjoy writing dialogue a lot, and it would be fun to do something pretty much all in dialogue. And why of all of the, I mean, I think Jennifer Bartlett's a wonderful artist, but why of yes. all the artists in the world uh, did you focus on her for your only work of nonfiction? Well, it just sort of happened, really. I, um, I, I always loved her work, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm sort of wired wrong for art in general. I'm not great at looking at art, but her art always spoke to me. And somebody was doing a series of writers on artists. Although it is interesting that uh, the the narrator of the title story in this book, Your Duck is My Duck, is an artist, although she's an artist who's floundering around when the story takes place. She had to be something. <laughs> she did do something wonderful in the past, and uh, and the and the yes. the the, the, uh, the painting that uh, starts off that story, Blue Hill, is one of her best works. But also tied to something personal because her husband had had it, her ex husband, and it begins when he sells it to these people. Yes, we don't know that they're married, but mm. um, uh, yes, he sells her wonderful painting. And I was very happy to have produced a wonderful painting, but I have no idea what it looks like. Well, that's the great thing about writing. You yes. can say it's a great painting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, um, yes, he uh, he gave away her best thing. <laughs> well, and um, the marriage fell apart as well. True. <laughs> uh, in your case, 40 years with the same partner, that's pretty impressive. Forty years is pretty impressive. Yes, with just on its own, it's pretty impressive. But yes, with the same person, <laughs> it is. It is. But uh, if whoever would have been with him for forty years or will mm -hmm. be from now on, I will be very happy because you mm -hmm. can't be bored even for an instant. Now I mentioned that it took you twelve years to complete the stories in this book. So am I going to have to wait 12 years to talk to you again? <laughs> I, I hope not. I hope not. And I hope we've got 12 years <laughs> left. The the book, the latest collection of short stories by Deborah Eisenberg is Your Duck is My Duck. It is published by Echo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of our show. My great thanks to Deborah Eisenberg, to Susie Stoltz, who produced the segment, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, and to my assistant producer, Jesse Lent, who was at the audio controls today. Lauder Lopez and Large come to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopez at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. 
You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. <laughs>